On this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, we are joined by one of the best college football writers on the planet, Andy Staples from The Athletic. We talk all things college football with Andy, but also talk some Oklahoma restaurants. The guy loves food. Before Andy's interview, we discuss local college football news, the new Sooner Schooner, some more drama with Mike Gundy in Oklahoma State, and what the OU and OSU presidents had to say about football season. We wet the beak with the Houston Astros, give you our winners and losers of the week, and talk about the Netflix documentary Athlete A and keeping it local. As always, we finish with your Twitter questions. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. Beautiful Thursday, June 25th. Now we're recording this on Wednesday night. Just a reminder, if your business is interested in sponsoring the podcast during football season, email Teddy and me at the Oklahoma Breakdown at gmail.com. And you can join our other sponsors. No big deal because Ted, our friends at Will and Wiley Hard Seltzer, they're on board, baby. Yes. Let's go. I'm telling you, you better. It's getting packed, baby. You better, uh, you better hurry up. Trains gonna, leaving the station. Trains people. leaving the station. In, in a shocking development that I did not see coming, Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School also on board as a sponsor. Local mm. high school flavor. How about that. I, I mean, just now, I, I am a proud alum of Bishop McGinnis, so it does make some sense. But I did not anticipate that email inquiry in my inbox but hey we'll take it baby two people signed up already so don't miss out we've got some more uh, more things in the works my as well. guess is enrollment in the in the coming semesters at bishop mcginnis is going to absolutely explode it's going to be what, crazy what's going to have a bigger spike bishop mcginnis's enrollment or tulsa coronavirus cases <laughs> direct correlation probably direct, <laughs> direct. Direct, direct correlation <laughs> All right, Ted, let's talk some football. Now we've got an awesome interview with my favorite college football writer, Andy Staples from The Athletic. We talk about everything uh, that's going on in the college football world. But before we get to Andy's interview, let's talk about some local college football news. And Teddy, the Sooner Schooner has emerged again. It is back, baby. Now looking a little more stable. Now normally – in pretty much every aspect of life, uh, shorter, wider, and heavier isn't a good thing. But in this case, it's a great thing for the Sooner Schooner. The thing looks solid, real, real solid from the pictures they put out there. I'm calling the new Schooner KG. This is, this is a Kelly Gregg. Uh, <laughs> it's modeled off after him. Wide, heavy, no way you're going to tip it over. It's fantastic. It's got that wide wheelbase, you know, kind of like the new model of the Ferrari Look, that went wide. I, I do have, I have one issue. Mm -hmm. It got made in Kansas. We couldn't find someone in the great state of Oklahoma yeah. to build that bad boy. What are we doing? Oh, I don't know. No I offense guess, to our friends in Kansas. Love you guys. I, I guess we, you know, if we thought about maybe we'd find some engineering students or something up at Oklahoma. I don't know. You, you'd think maybe they could, could get that done. What I think is interesting is – how many people, what is Werner wagons, right? How many wagons do they build a year for people? I mean, <laughs> how often does someone call them and say, listen, guys, I need your help. We, we need one, man. to have a wagon. I mean, we don't know what we're going to do if we don't get a new wagon. Got to have it. A, a Kinestiga. Got to have it. That's a wagon, right? Did I just make that word? I think that's a wagon. I, I don't know. But, hey, as long as what happened during the, what, was that the West Virginia game? 
Oh my gosh. Still. Is that right? West Virginia? I think that's right. But still one of the wildest things I've ever seen in person, just watching that wagon tip over. But we're if glad you're back. The thing about how exciting that game was, we essentially broadcast and rebroadcast the uh, dump over of the schooner for the rest oh, of the Oh, me game. and Plank were all over it. We were on the field. I mean, we went out on the field. We were fixing the grass. We were doing our part. But <laughs> We got the driver. We got the passengers that dumped out of the back. I think, uh, I think you even got a couple of statements from the horses. I mean, that was – that was we talked to Kenny Bossman. Broadcast. We talked to everyone. Everyone. We needed we needed some content for that radio broadcast. So glad to have the schooner back. Now things still a little dicey in Stillwater. Pete Thamel from Yahoo Sports comes out with an article about Mike Gundy. And it wasn't the greatest look for Mike Gundy. Now I want to make something clear. Mike Gundy is not the only coach in college football that doesn't know all of his players' names. I actually think that's relatively common, especially with the walk-ons. And I know in in Thamel's article, it talks about a guy, he's having an issue, he's laying down, holding his chest, and they move the drill. Teddy, you and I have been part of, I don't know how many practices where the exact same thing has happened. Anytime a guy goes down, whether it's a knee, anything, you don't really know. You move the drill. That that that's just football. So I didn't really get Thamel's criticism of Gundy on that. No, I mean that's how it goes. I would say that I'm probably guilty of uh of moving wanting to move the drill more so than most coaches. Um <laughs> So I can, Get up. I, can, I can completely under, which on a side note, um, Wayne Chambers played linebacker um, whenever I was at OU and Lance Mitchell, he tore an ACL and, and had to miss a year as, as the linebacker. We were, Wayne Chambers was working in at the, at the Mike backer spot. And I had to, I had to kind of take him under my wing and, and, you know, give him a crash course on the defense. And I wasn't very easy on him at times. And one day in the spring scrimmage, he, you know, we were, it was like a live, live period and we're pursuing the football to one of the sidelines and we like combine on a tackle on a guy and we're getting up and I get up and I'm jogging back and I'm like, let's go get back to the huddle. What are you doing? Come on. And he's like, ah, my hand, man, my hand. Ah, I was like, dude, it's your hand get out here, let's go, get the signal, make the call. What, what is it? What are we in? What's the down and distance? And I'm just like hammering him. And I look down and he takes his glove off and he's got a bone sticking through his <laughs> finger oh. and blood pouring everywhere. And I was like, uh, yeah, you may want to take a knee and let's get that thing looked at. Uh, maybe, maybe we need to see a doctor real quick. Real quick. That's uh, I, oh. I almost passed out whenever he pulled his glove off. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So that's a great example of, you know, when injuries happen in football practice, you move the drill. That, that, that's what you do. Now, Mike Gundy, not knowing the kid's name, telling all the players after practice that he's fine. Yeah. That's not a great look either, but still to me, it, I wasn't shocked by that. I mean, that happens every Pro, at every program, I mean, there's a lot of players. I mean, it's not the easiest thing in the world. But the the alarming thing about Thamel's article on Gundy for me was he basically painted a picture of Mike Gundy being completely disconnected from his players, especially when all the coronavirus stuff started. And they were kind of in the dark getting their information from people that – Mike Gundy pawned that responsibility off to that wasn't a good look in my mind. And I think behavior like that probably is one of the many things that led to the Chuba Hubbard tweet, which has now led to change, right? We saw OSU announced a new diversity council that'll be led there by the university's chief diversity officer. It's going to include student athletes, students, and alumni. So that seems like a good call. But yeah, Gundy, not the best look 
from a leadership standpoint in this article, Ted. No, and I, I still don't think Gundy's completely out of the woods. I don't. Um, You're sticking to that. You, I mean, I, yeah, I, no, I, I got he's, you. He's burned so much capital. He's burned capital with the, uh, the administration, athletic director, president, with all of the, the apologies and different things that they've had to issue, the, the back and forth that they've had. Uh, whether it's about recruiting or games they should have won, contract negotiations, all of those things. He's burned a lot of capital, obviously, with the football team. Um, you know, I, I didn't think, honestly, by the way it was sounding from the president and the athletic director, that he was going to make it the day the OAN t-shirt thing came out. Right. And, and a lot of that, that blew up. Well, fast forward to Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, I believe, and you have the Alfred Williams still come out. And, you know, I, I know there's been apology in there. I know that he did an interview and, and called himself a dumbass and, and how dumb everything was. And he's done all of those things. But I haven't heard a whole lot from the administration. I haven't heard a whole lot of, you know, players really showing solidarity and saying, hey, Coach Gundy messed up. You know, he apologized for it. I think it was sincere. I believe him. I know he he has his players' best interest. We just – we haven't seen that. We haven't seen that from the administration. Yeah. We haven't seen that from the players. I mean, we yeah, haven't I, really even seen that from the fans. The, the biggest endorsement, right, was Spencer Sanders maybe saying there's no other coach he'd, you know, rather ride with or something similar to that in a tweet. But – yeah, you haven't seen just this outpouring of support for Mike Gundy, and I think there's some things in this article that maybe tell us why, because it, he seems like he was disconnected from his players, and if you're that disconnected with your players, I can only imagine what it's like with your staff and then with your administration. So I, I don't know, man, but uh, I When's still think – When's the last think time he seemed happy with that job? Oh, man, 2011 when they beat our ass in Stillwater, maybe? I don't, I don't I know. I mean, he, he's flirted with a bunch of different opportunities. You know, he, he's he's pointed fingers. Ne and that's, never really that's rubbed a lot of people. Uh, that's rubbed a lot yeah. of people the wrong way there in Stillwater Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. I just – he's never really seemed happy with the job. And if you're not happy with the job, you're not going to be connected with your players and your coaches and your administration. You're essentially, uh, you know, collecting a check, yeah. you know, and, and you know, I, I'm, I can't say necessarily that that's exactly what Gundy's done, but I can definitely see how people in positions of power could assume just that. Yeah. Speaking of those positions of power, uh, OU president, Joe Harris and OSU president Burns Hargis took part in a virtual town hall with the Tulsa world. Some interesting things came out of it uh, I really only care about what they said about football to be honest and Joe Harris said quote we're going to have football the question is in what form now he thinks some decisions need to be made mid to late July he also said he believes they'll have fans but added quote when you look at how we can get together and how we can be together masks are going to be an essential element and Teddy, you know as well as I do, a lot of Oklahomans are not going to like that. They're not going to like if in order to go to a football game, they have to wear a mask. We've seen the backlash in this state already with that issue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, there are there, – there's a, a, a fairly large group of people – in Oklahoma that will tell you that they're not wearing a mask. It doesn't matter the circumstance. And if you read the fine print in that statement and find there, the asterisk, it says, unless it uh, means a college football game. That's, you know? When I was thinking about it, I was thinking the same thing. It was like, yeah, all these people, you know, they're, they're pretty outspoken about not wearing masks and you know, their rights and all this stuff. And I get it. But, 
you tell them they can't come to a football game if they don't wear one. I'd like to think people's hate for masks would be overpowered by their passion for college football. It's, I can see how it goes. Uh, first fan shows up, sir, you've got to have a mask to come to the game. I ain't wearing a mask. I know my rights. I'm a citizen of this country. Uh, sir, you're not going to make it in. Well, hell, okay. And then he pulls out, and he's already got his OU mask in his back he's got, pocket. He's got like a Gucci, a <laughs> yeah. Gucci mask. He's like, I bought a nice one. I want you to know I don't like putting it on, though. <laughs> I don't know why we're doing that voice for the OU football fan, but I'm going to keep – that is now the official OU football fan voice that's my for this standard, podcast. That's my standard fan voice for pretty much – For every, everyone. Every fan base, L.A. included. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's the – it's the angry country guy. <laughs> it's it's intense. I like it. Now, <laughs> Burns Hargis, as I mentioned, also spoke at this virtual town hall, and he made it clear that football provides 85% of Oklahoma State's total athletic budget. That seems significant. Uh, but he also said, quote, I think you could come up with a method where you have fans in the stands. I doubt that you can fill them up. So – when you hear the leadership of the two big universities in Oklahoma say things like this, it, it makes you very skeptical that there's going to be full stadiums, at least at the start of the season. We, we don't know how things will progress, but if they're having those, those discussions right now and a decision needs to be made mid to late July, Ted, I, I don't know, man, but I'm, I'm just reading between the lines here. And, I mean, these are the guys, and I know that it'll be up to the governor, right, I think, yeah. but these are well, the guys that have a lot of influence. I'll tell you what, um, and I agree, it's, you know, this thing, there's ebb and flow to it. You know, at, at one point during late April, it was like, oh, my God, is this thing, is this going to spin out of control? What are we looking at here? And then by the end of May, early June, it's like, okay, we got a really good grasp on this thing. We're going to be just fine. And now we have another spike, so we're worried again. You know, two, three weeks from now, we're going to be living in a completely different world. Who knows what it's going to look like? But for the time being, it does look like that we're, you know, there, there's going to be some type of, um, some type of limit to, to fan bases and, and who's going to be in the stadium. Now, in – I think it is interesting that the governors are going to have the, the, the say, but they're not going to be, you know, the governor's not the one selling the tickets at the end. So the governor's going to set the, set the bar, but it wouldn't shock me like in Oklahoma's case specifically in, in this, in this state, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if we got the word from the state government that, we're allowing 75% capacity in stadiums for big events. And the University of Oklahoma said, we're going 50% or we're going 35%, whatever that may be. It wouldn't shock me if some places go below what the state is allowing. I mean, right. that, that may not be the case, but in some places it wouldn't shock me if that happened. Yeah, well, we know that they've been modeling for – all kinds of different capacities and, and scenarios. So uh, one place there will be no fans is Oklahoma State's fan day, you know, where they do the meet and greet. You can get the players' autographs. You can take pictures with them. That has officially been canceled. Teddy, uh, I don't think we've heard any news on the meet the Sooners day, but one would assume I, – I think it's an educated guess that – the same thing is going to happen for Oklahoma. I would be surprised if a single one of those happens across the country, right? Well, I mean, just maybe to be Alabama. Com completely honest, I don't know how excited anyone really is about having those days when it comes to the uh, the football program, the players, coaches. Oh, so everyone. Awful. Um, you know, the fan bases obviously like it because they can get their kids in there and. You know, uh, I like how they had that rule later that only kids can come in. They didn't have that rule when I was there, did they? They didn't have that rule when I was there, which led to some really fun things 
which also included Trent Williams. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. A pretty, pretty damn good football player. Plays for the 49ers now. Uh, has had a pretty decent NFL career. We'd always get the eBay guys, right? They come with the deflated footballs. Mm-hmm. And Trent would Trent invented a signature uh, that just said "fuck you" in really <laughs> fancy writing. It was like it looked like a player signature, but it just said "fuck you" giant nice. over the footballs. It was so funny every single time. Uh, I always I always love that. But yeah, I, I don't think um, the fan bases are. And I know it's frustrating, and, and especially in a season where tickets are going to be incredibly difficult to come by, and you know a, a lot of a lot of families and kids, this is their only opportunity to to get a, a a photo taken or just be around and see their their favorite players up close. So uh, it's it's not what you want. You definitely want to keep cultivating that younger fan base no doubt people no doubt. It's engaged just, with the university with what's going on with the coronavirus there's just no way you can explain having one of these i mean you, you you just can't do it so it is what it is the coronavirus is the worst it continues to suck joy from all of our lives but you know what a guy that brought some joy to our lives ted is andy staples from the athletic he is an absolute beast when it comes to co- covering college football. And here's our interview with Andy. It is our pleasure to be joined by the best college football writer on planet Earth, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, Andy Staples from The Athletic and The Andy Staples Show. Is that an Andy Staples Show, right? It show? is. It is the Andy Staples show, and yes, I know what the initials spell. Yes, the ass podcast. <laughs> That's right. Get some ass. <laughs> as good as any. How are we doing, big guy? We're good. We're good. We're, uh, we're still quarantining, as it were. You know, I see you haven't shaved either. That's good to know. Uh, but yeah. Well, he shaved this morning. If, if oh. you know Gabe, he's, uh, he can grow a beard in somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. Well, the last time I shaved was about four days ago, and I could go about two weeks and I still wouldn't have a beard. So I am waiting for puberty to kick in. I, I hope at some point in my 40s it will. By it's the end of this of interview, time. Gabe will have a, what looks beard. Like a three-week-old beard. There's no <laughs> doubt. I am what I am, guys. Accept me. It's fine. Now, Andy, before we get to – the interesting developments in college football over the last couple of days and last couple of weeks, I do want to talk about your true passion first, and that is food. Yes. Even though you used to be a bigger guy and now you're <laughs> a not so big guy. What, first of all, what's going on though? What are your methods? Just in case okay. we have any listeners that are trying to shed some LBs because You've lost a ton of weight. So at the national championship game, it was about 280. And as of last Friday's weigh-in, I only weigh myself once a week because I don't want to get all obsessed with the scale. But I was 243. So the the initial goal was get down to 235. And I think I can do that. But I think I may actually keep trying just see where it goes from there. Um, But I am doing intermittent fasting. So I I eat from – in an eight hour window every day. So it's like 11 p.m. or 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. or, or noon to, to 8 p.m. But that's that's when I eat and no calories other than like black coffee or some tea with some stevia in it the rest of the day. Water, that's it. I love it. I, I did the intermittent fasting for a little while and I had to stop. I, at, after a certain point, I started disappearing whenever it was first <laughs> happening. I was like, Hey, this is pretty good. I was just, you know, gradually yep. dropping some weight, uh, leaning out, and then it just like started like jumping. I was like, dude, if I keep this up, I'm gonna weigh like 200 pounds, and people are gonna think that I'm sick. So I, yeah, <laughs> I that's the stop. thing. I I'm, I'm just trying to. I, I like it because there's there. I have no other rules than that. I can eat whatever I want, and now. For the first 20 pounds or so, I was eating 
whatever I wanted in those eight hours. I've, I've had to cut it back a little bit because I was kind of plateauing, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing is I, I've been trying to figure out, at, you know, with the gym back open, as I add weights back in, I got to eat some more. I just, you know, I got to make sure it's, I'm eating the right stuff, but yeah, I like it. It's, it's, it's crazy. Cause like you, you pick up a 35 pound dumbbell and you think, Oh wait, I was carrying that around nuts all day, okay. every day. It's like a 35 pound plate that should have been on your, on your back walking exactly. around. Exactly. I don't know how you are, but whenever I did it, so I, I, I just kind of dipped my toe in the water at first. I, I would do like on a day, off a day. And after like two or three days on, I was like, this isn't that bad at all. No, and it's, then, I will, I will say I, I was watching billions the other day and the artist character in billions is doing it. And, uh, and Wendy Rhodes goes, yeah, he does intermittent fasting because he wants his, his mind clear when he's painting. I never got that. I don't get that clarity of mind when I've been starving myself <laughs> for 16 hours. Like, I am a mess at 10.55 a.m. every morning. I, so I, at first, I was kind of like that. I started drinking a ridiculous amount of water because when you're yeah. hungry, you got to grab some water. Exactly. Um, but so I was doing the 8 to noon, and then I – my regular radio show starts at two o'clock mm -hmm. so you know i would you weren't doing much during those shows yeah so typically i would you know as soon as it's done i'd eat a big lunch and then i would you know eat again before the 8 p.m but sometimes because i have a job in the morning i'd be running yep. late and i'd go right to my show and then i'd get home and i'd play with my son yep. and the next thing i know it's like it's eight o'clock again it's been 24 hours i haven't eaten I haven't even thought about food. I'm not hungry right now. So I'll just roll on into the next day. And, it was, and you're like, what the hell is happening? Yeah, here? I, I have, I have never had that problem where I forgot to eat. I, I did early on try to push it one day just to see how far I could go with it. And I got to about 21 hours and I was like, you nope, I, I gotta, I'm getting lightheaded it's here. I gotta eat. <laughs> well, Let's let's talk just a little food. Wow, that intermittent fasting that went on a tangent that I didn't expect. But hey, whatever. Yeah, people people want the methods. This is the method where you can still eat bread and still eat chocolate, and you can lose some weight. And full disclosure, I do the seven to eleven intermittent fasting because of Andy Staples because we were doing a Sirius XM show one day yeah. together, and he was like, "You should try it." And I was like, "Okay, sure." And I've been doing it ever since you told me I to try. I feel like it. it's good for for athletes because you can follow rule. Like we all like to eat, but guys who've been in regimented programs can follow very basic rules and will stick to those. Like Gives will you that not structure. cheat on those yeah. rules. Yes. That's a, that's a great point. Now, if you were to go completely off the rails right now, but you can eat what you want. I know mm -hmm. you're a connoisseur of restaurants. I know you have some favorites here in the state of Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. So let's say you were able to make a trip to the beautiful state of Oklahoma right now. Where are you going, buddy? I'm going to Tarahumara, Tarahumara's and getting some, some fajitas. God bless you. Eat, eating some of that free queso that, that for some reason y'all put on the table – the rest of the world charges for it, but not no KC, not not Norman. Hell, they'll fill your cup up with it here, and you just have it as a drink. I, I don't, yeah, what's the there's there's the other you know famous OKC Mexican place. I know you y'all have Salinos. one in Norman. Yeah, that does like the giant margaritas. Mm -hmm. I, I really do think they have like a queso margarita. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Why not? They don't. They should. <laughs> But yes, that it, I still haven't really found another state that does Tex-Mex the way that Oklahoma does. And that's why it makes it the best Tex-Mex. And I've heard you say that Tara Mars and Norman is your favorite Mexican restaurant. And is that and still I the can truth? Never uh, yeah, and I can't explain why. Like, there's nothing technical about it or, or you know, there's no special gimmicky ingredient. There's There's nothing different that – just stands out it's just the entire experience is perfect they make great salsa they make the salsa there it's there when you get to the table the queso is there and it's free i'm not even a big queso guy i just appreciate that it's an option and then the fajita plate is massive and all of it's good they're always attentive and and you know i just it's it's a great experience i don't know how else to say it because the place like there's a place called superica in atlanta and their fajita plate is unbelievable it's got like it's not just beef it's steak and it's not just pork it's pork belly 
Like, it is awesome. But I don't know that I'd trade that. That's how good Tarhumar is. It, it's hard to argue with service. I mean, as soon as you sit down, someone runs out and throws the salsa at you, throws the, oh, uh, the chips at you. You you take a drink of your beverage before it hits the table. They're giving you a new one. Uh, it, it's it's incredible service. And I, I think the food's fantastic. But here's the thing. The best part about it is when you're walking away, it's like, I've got to go sit down. Like, you do not leave that place <laughs> hungry. Oh, exactly. Because I mean, you fill up on the chips, as one does at a place like that. But the fajitas are so good that you still – ate all of that too so you really need a wheelbarrow to get out that's the only way now now i could probably do the intermittent fast for 24 hours after after that oh, place oh hell yeah easily <laughs> but it's so it's so good i i may drive to norman here in the next couple of days well, and eat let, there. let me just let by me myself like another, a weirdo let me ask you about another place that that i ate at when the ncaa tournament was in okc this is remember when uh Texas A&M had the crazy comeback against Northern Iowa that year. Oh, so yeah. I had a place called Kitchen Number 324. Kitchen and 324. Holy sure. cow, that was one of the better breakfasts I've had. Um, there was some sort of – it was like a bacon cake, essentially. And Is that the one it that's was, in the bottom of the, uh, the Braniff building? Yes. Downtown? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that place is really good. And it is – I don't know – I don't know what it's called. They just basically called it ba- – the, the waiter said it is basically bacon cake. And it was – I guess it was kind of a quiche, but it had layers of bacon stripped through it. Oh, my God. I have dreams about that thing still. Well, you're just going to have to come back, man, and we'll go – Oh, I know. We'll go eat at Tara Mars and Kitchen 324 together. And there's a bunch of – dude, you – there is a bunch of new restaurants, really good new restaurants. Here in Oklahoma City. Well, I, I guess we will talk about football now if we have to. But the food stuff was a little more fun because, boys, how, how are we feeling about college football right now? Kind of some iffy news coming out the last couple of weeks. We saw Kansas State have to shut down things. We saw Boise yep. State having to start stop voluntary workouts this week. Andy, I. Should I be scared? I'm not scared. I'm still optimistic, but this isn't the type of week we wanted for college football. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I feel a little less optimistic than I did if you'd asked me about this a week or two ago. Uh, Because, you know, I was looking at at numbers and and listen, as long as the positive percentage, the the percentage of positive tests was was flat or, or, you know, not terrible, and the percentage of hospitalizations was down or flat, that's okay. When you see hospitalizations going up, when you see percent positives going way, way up, that's the part where you start to get a little worried. And so I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, everybody I've talked to, it still feels like they are, they're trying as best they can to get the season off the ground on time. And I think a lot of that is they feel like if they don't start on time, there may be some kind of interruption if there's a second wave, say November, December that would come and wipe it out. So they want to try to get as many games in as they can. So it's, it's a lot. And a lot of the big problem is everybody's dealing with the unknown. Nobody knew exactly what would happen when you brought people back to campus. And what you're seeing is, is people are getting infected. I mean, they're, they're getting around more people than they've been around. They're getting around people who are different than the people they've been around. And if one person's got it, it's getting passed around. So, you know, I'll be curious to see how everybody handles this because like Clemson had a bunch of positive tests. They did not shut down the workouts. They kept quarantining the people. I don't know. I don't know which is better. Like if you've got a bunch of asymptomatic people, I'm not going to suggest a chicken pox party because hey, I don't think that's Teddy, ethical. Teddy, give them, give them your theory. This is give them the Teddy chicken, Layman theory. Chicken, po- chicken pox party. I've been saying this for a long time that, you know, these guys are, it, the virus does not leave. It doesn't stop. I mean, I know right. a lot of people have been, you know, we've been looking at numbers and we've been hoping that everything drops down and we get to a point to where we can say, you know, college football is back and there's no doubt about it. And I think a lot of people are eyeing like, 
you know, that zero number, like we're not no more. That's not zero. Zero is not going to happen. That's why I keep telling people it's people keep saying vaccine, this vaccine, that even if it's a vaccine, you know, it might be like the flu vaccine where people will still get it. You may still get it even if you have the vaccine. So zero is not the number you're shooting for. What you're shooting for is hospitals that aren't overwhelmed and you don't want anybody to die. And you don't want people to have long-term damage. So the fewer people you put in the hospital, the better off you are. Now, these asymptomatic cases, which is what seems to be the, the bulk of the cases with the age group we're talking about in college football, I worry less about those guys. I, I worry about the support staff people and everybody who works with them who, who might be older because they are at, at bigger risk. But, you know, I, I am curious to see, you know, as these teams go, will – say, uh, you know, we have a situation where you're two weeks away from camp and half the team has had it in quarantine already. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a couple of ways this is going to go down. Um, the first way is there continues to be a bunch of panic whenever we get positive tests and they shut down uh, workouts, practices, completely isolate the person, isolate the, the the people that that person has been around, which right now is easy. We yeah. get into college football season and you're in training camp and someone tests positive. Well, uh, they've been around everybody. They've been around yep. every player. And they've been around every on coach, yeah. every trainer, every equipment manager, everyone on the support staff. So, you know, you're talking about the entire facility. So, you know, if you're shutting down then, you know, we got problems and we're not going to be able to have a college football season, you know, the, the way we imagine it or really at all. So it's going to go that way. The other way is they stop testing these guys. And <laughs> if, if, if you are, if they continue <clears throat> to have, I don't think they're going to get away with that one. Well, I mean, here, here's the thing though. If, if you continue to test and you continue to pull guys out and separate them, and, and try and separate people that they've been, been around. You're right. talking about pulling coaches out. You're talking about pulling starting quarterbacks out. You're top, uh, who, maybe the quarterback room gets it. Maybe Lincoln Riley, uh, Spencer Rattler, Tanner Mordecai, all test positive. None of them have any symptoms, but right. all of them have tested positive during the week. What are you, you going to do? Exactly. Well, and that, that's the part that – nobody's been able to answer yet. And I remember, you know, I was talking to Joe Castiglione, the, the AD in Oklahoma about this, and he's on the working group for the big 12 to try to determine some protocols. And that, that's the question I'd love to hear the answer to that, that I don't think they're going to try to come at, even come out with an answer with until they get until, you know, maybe about a month out from the season. And that's how many people is your threshold where you say, okay, we got to postpone this game or cancel this game. Is it, is it four? Is it five? Is it 10? I don't know what that is. Cause you'd think if it's one or two, you could, you could isolate somebody, but like your point, if you just found out somebody's positive, they've probably been positive for a little bit. If they practiced probably breathed on a lot of people and, and we're in close contact with a lot of people. So yeah, it, I, I don't know. I, I don't think they can get away with just saying we're not going to test anymore. Well, but, I think you, you, they could probably get away with saying we're only going to test if someone shows symptoms because, I mean, here's yeah. what we're talking about. We're talking about, okay, we tested a um, week of the game. We do our weekly test, and mm -hmm. we had eight guys test positive, and they're all starters, and they've been around everyone. Do we cancel the game? What do we do? Right. And you're talking about eight guys that are standing here just fine. They've got no symptoms. They've right. got no fever. They've got no cough. 100% asymptomatic. We're canceling a game over guys that had they not taken a test would, you know, would appear, would have no idea. Well, And, and that's, that's going to be the, yeah, that's going to be the issue because that is the bulk of the cases in that age group. Yeah. So, and, and I, I honestly don't know the answer to that because my well, thing is they're going to have to figure out a way to live with this thing. It's not, it's not going to be exact, zero. That's right. the exact point right there. We're going to have to figure out a way to, to live with it. You know, at, it, 
the the goal was never to wait this thing out until there's zero cases. It's just to make sure that we're not not overwhelmed at the hospitals. And for the most part, they've got that look now. Look now, I'm not saying go out and everyone just go crazy, but yeah, we have to we have to start realizing we're going to live in a world where the coronavirus is going to be around, and at some point you're going to have to say we've got to get back to doing what we've done now pay special close attention to the demographics that are affected by this this thing that's really the one thing that we do know is we've got good hard data on who's affected who's not where the severe cases are going what demographic that is comorbidities and those type of things yep. we actually do have good data there so we know the vulnerable and who to protect yeah and it, the the thing is that, that that i worry about with this is you know, you look at Texas and you got the governor, as we're recording this podcast tonight, the governor of Texas, who has been pretty outspoken on get the economy back moving, learn to live with it. He's saying if the hospitalization rates keep going up in Texas, they might have to shut some stuff back down. So that's that's where you got to look at it and go, all right, is this a blip that they're going to get through? Or is this something that they're going to have to to come up with some more, you know, firm, you can't do this, you can't do this. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm in Florida. So we didn't open up first. You so heathens. We've been open. <laughs> we, we've been open. Um, and our numbers, depending on where you are, like where I live, the hospitalization numbers are up, but not, not to the co- to where you're caused for extreme concern. South Florida is a little bit different. So it kind of depends on where you are. But I, I just wonder, is this what's going to happen to everybody as they open up? Is this a part of that process, or is there a better way to do it? And to be honest, we don't know. That's sort of, that's sort of been the issue with, with this thing the whole time, is this is all new for everybody. So, you know, everybody said, well, look at what New Zealand did. Well, we're not New Zealand, okay? This is, this is not – this is a different kind of country. It's a lot bigger. It's a lot harder to manage. So I don't know – what the right answer is. I just hope that we see that these hospital numbers are going back down in a couple of weeks, because if they do, then you can say, all right, that is a natural part of the process where if you open up, you're going to get this spike and then you can, you can absorb it. And then you're, you keep going. If they keep going up though, then, then we got problems. Yeah. There's no doubt. Not, not great the trends that we're seeing this week, but the, the fact that we're still trying to figure out how often to test guys, what are teams going to do when the season rolls around, when it comes to testing, uh, is yep. the opponent going to pay for the tests? When are they going to test? Are they going to test before they get on the flight? When they get there? I mean, there's so many logistics. Yeah, if to you're work playing out. a non-conference game and your conference has this test protocol and they, and they have this test protocol, do you have to match them up? Yeah. Do you think they'll get to like, do you think they'll get to like a universal testing, just like a blanket protocol for all of college football or for maybe like at least the power five, right? I think they'd almost have to just to play non-conference games. I think at least the whole FBS, just, just so everybody feels comfortable with somebody coming into their, their stadium. This would be a good time for the NCAA to have a nice voice that's trusted that can not exactly lay down the law, but at least issue some guidance, maybe update where the conversation is. What are some sticking points? Teddy, what do they got to work through? Way too much sense, and it would take a solid figurehead leader in the NCAA, which they do not have, sir. No, nope. I just, I just don't think you like being the president of the NCAA is just you get paid a million dollars you to get yelled at. <laughs> that's that's what it is that's the you know job. what i'd do it i'd do it Why not? <laughs> yeah absolutely but like you're not going to overpower greg sankey at the sec or you know you're not gonna yell shout down bob bullsby because in a lot of ways the the power five commissioners have a lot more power than the president of the ncaa because they do control the football postseason they really control football i mean the ncaa can do a little bit but the schools also are the ncaa if, if the ncaa you know, office says, hey, we want to do this, and none of the conferences want to do it, the conferences will go, guess what? We're just going to talk to our presidents who are on the council and be like, mm-hmm. not, no, no, we're, not we're good. 
We're playing. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and play. Thanks, though. We appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for the exactly. suggestion. But exactly. When, when it does come to the games, uh, we saw Iowa halting, you know, single game ticket sales. They're still, yep. I think some people misunderstood it a little bit. They're still putting them out there for their season ticket holders. And I assume they're at or near the number that they want. Yeah, because they, they sell a bunch of tickets. So, yeah. it's, they're, they're, so they're, they're, not, they're not putting them on Groupon yeah. next year. So, so Andy, what do, you, what do you think about fans in the stands this year, especially early in the year? Because it, it's really starting to feel like at the most we're going to see stadiums, what, 50% full maybe? Yeah, maybe a quarter. I, 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 I think you got to be pretty careful with that because – you can't if if these numbers are still going up the way they are, putting a hundred thousand people together in a confined space, even though it is outdoors, seems a little bit a little bit dodgy. But you know, twenty five thousand people in a stadium designed to hold a hundred, people can people can move apart. You know, they'd be pretty comfy actually. I, I don't know, but uh, you know, I think if you're the Power Five leagues, you make so much money off TV. Your first priority is get the game played, get the TV show made. Worry about whether you have fans in the stands after that. And I, I really think the fans in the stands thing is going to come down to the states. It's not going to be the schools that decide it. It's not going to be any conferences that decide it. it for, for Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, it'll be the state of Oklahoma that says you're allowed to have this many people within this many feet of one another. You know, the state of Texas will say that. The state of Florida will say that. The state of Michigan will say that. And then – everybody's just going to have to deal with it. When I, when I talk to people at athletic departments and they're trying to, because they had to model this out a month ago and they were modeling it out based on their state's, you know, social distancing policies at the time. And then they, they modeled a bunch of different other ones to see what would work. I remember I had one guy tell me, and this is a place where every ticket sells every game that they could only get 18 to 20% based on their state's social distancing policy. Like, can you imagine the conversations you got to have with season ticket holders? And then, and then how do you Oklahoma do it? Oklahoma has 60 some thousand season exactly. ticket holders in a stadium that holds 85,000. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is, you know, you can't, you probably can't just say, well, you guys who donated the most money, we're just going to give you tickets to all the games. Like maybe you do three and three and you know, the, the, the highest dollar ones get the best three and then, then the other ones get the next three. But you have to figure out something. you got to figure out a way to, ha to make those people satisfied, keep them happy, because they might not want to give you any money next year after you cut them off this year. So that, I don't envy the people in the athletic departments who are going to have to deal with it because they're going to be pissed. You know they're going to be pissed. And I know everybody wants to play in front of a full stadium, and, and I've talked to ADs that say that's their goal, but it's not going to be your decision. It's going to be your governor's decision. And if the governor says you can't do it, you're going to have to deal with it. So I, I just, you know, I think their priority should be get the TV show made first, because that's, you know, if you're in the big 12, that's 40 million bucks a school. If you're in the, if you're in the SEC, that's 54 million bucks a school. If you're in the, in the big 10, that's almost 60 million bucks a school. It's not what you want. It's not a full stadium and, and the money coming in from that but it's probably enough to keep you going. And I don't, I don't know if it's – maybe you have a, an answer on this, but I don't know if, if it's enough to move the needle, but you got to figure that across the country, if we're talking about, you know, we've got, what, 130 Division I schools, mm -hmm. you know, half of those are hosting home games, and let's say that uh, on average it's a, it's a 25 or 30% capacity. There's going to be a hell of a lot of people watching college football from home. So you would imagine oh, yeah. there's going to be a rating spike and mm -hmm. maybe which an allows you to spike. ask for more money next time. Yeah. That, uh, so I'm wondering if there's any way that they could recoup any of those dollar bills that way. I mean, well, and, and, and the thing is, we'll see. I, I, I imagine a very grateful ESPN would, would might be willing to, to help out renegotiate a little bit, because this is the other part that, that is why I keep saying they will try to move heaven and earth to play football this school year. Because you think about it, so you've got the athletic departments, and, and none of those ADs want to lay off their employees, and, and there would have to be massive layoffs if they don't play football. 
nobody wants to to have to deal with that part of it. The networks have this programming that they are charging for. They're charging your cable company for it. If they don't deliver the live sports, the cable company may say, well, we're not paying you this. Like ESPN gets seven bucks a month. They've already the had it, the record yeah, number of cord cutters it, this during the right. last quarter. And so, and, and the cable company may say, well, listen, you didn't deliver what we asked for. So we're not paying you this and we've got to cut people's bills or they're going to cancel us. So there's a lot riding on this. And you've got your Disney shareholders who are saying, ESPN, you better get this off, you know, better go off the schneid here or, or we're going to be really mad. And, you know, so there's a lot riding on all of it. Local economies as well. I mean, oh, yeah. Norman, you, you just yeah. look at Norman, Oklahoma, and that is a, it's a football driven town, a, a yeah. university driven town. If you take away that, I mean, I know it's, what eight home games a year, but that's the lifeblood of Campus Corner and the hotel well, industry yeah. and all that. Well, stuff. I, I live in Gainesville, Florida, so every hotel, every restaurant, every basically any hospitality industry stuff in Gainesville is in the red if they don't play football. Mm. So it, I mean, it's it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal all around, and that's why you see. And because I, I went on a radio show in North Carolina the other day. And the hosts were shocked that I was saying they're going to try this hard to play football. But this is why they're going to try this hard to play football. And, you know, you can say, oh, it's the cult of football. No, it's not. It is very real economic consequences if the sport doesn't get played. Yeah, and it's people. And yeah, yeah. And you can say, oh, well, the players aren't getting paid and all that stuff. But you guys were very good players. My guess or in my sense from talking to people – is the players want to play? I mean, that's they'd rather play than sit around. That's that's my thing, and, and I think it may come to that point, guys, where the players know the risks, and maybe some guys won't sign the waiver. And we've you know we've heard about these liability. See, I, don't, waivers. I don't think they should sign the waiver anyway. I think they should just go. I'll work out. I'll play, but I'm not signing that. Yeah, no, I, you, you got the power right now, so just. Don't sign anything they shove in your face, but go play. Yeah, I think, you know, we've got a lot of people that I feel like are speaking for the players, and, and that's yeah. their job, right? They're athletic yeah. directors, they're head coaches. Like, they're, they're in those positions of authority, but we haven't just sat down with a college football team, you know, with the team's 10 best players and, go, and gone, hey, do you guys want to play? Even if you know – like, you ask a guy like – We did, a, we did an anonymous – yeah, we did an anonymous survey at The Athletic, and it was overwhelming that they wanted to play. Yeah, it's like you ask Panay Sewell there at Oregon, like, hey, if this Washington defensive end's got the coronavirus but he's asymptomatic, you cool with playing against him? He'd probably go, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, it's just I, – I don't yeah. know why – you mentioned the kids having the power, though. Now, and Andy, this is something that you've been writing about for a long, long time. I mean, I remember, I think it was about a decade ago, you were writing about name, image, and likeness, and we're starting to see kind of what you were writing about way back in like 2010. Oh, so, uh, 2011, I wrote exactly what's going to happen next year, and people thought it was insane. You're like, like Miss you Cleo. That never happened. Well, I didn't think it would happen. I, I thought it would happen eventually, but I thought I figured I'd be like 70 when it happened. I, I was thinking like 2040, maybe, <laughs> but, but not, I guess I'll be 60 then. But, uh, but yeah, I, I figured it'd be a while before it happened, but I didn't, I did not figure on the States getting involved and, and just kind of ramming it down the NCAA's throat like that. But yeah, I mean, and it's interesting because the, the, the NCAA and the schools kind of gave the players this power sort of piece by piece not even realizing, not trying to, but they just did. And it's funny because I, I see, you know, the Iowa thing, the Oklahoma State thing, the Texas thing, and people say, well, just yank their scholarships. You can't. If you yanked a bunch of scholarships, you would nuke your program into, like, necessary roughness. Like, it would look like a documentary. <laughs> But <laughs> Kathy Ireland would show up kicking field goals. <laughs> well, I, you know, <laughs> Scott Bakula would be the quarter. Scott Bakula might have to be the quarterback if he's got oh. some eligibility left. Okay. I do want to ask you about the players using their voices and kind of the pandemic and, and all the protests, you know, making a situation where those guys feel 
you know, kind of understand their platform and their power now. But Teddy's favorite or second favorite football movie of all time, mm-hmm. or second favorite sports movie of all time, yeah. is the program. Excellent. So uh, yes. I am just gonna I'm just gonna let you talk about because I know you know that movie inside and out. Oh, and I told Teddy goodness. you would give him some great little tidbits about the program. So Teddy. I interviewed Dwayne Davis this summer. Dwayne Davis, best known now as the father of, of Wyatt Davis, the Ohio State offensive guard who's probably going to be a first-round draft pick at some point. But Dwayne Davis played Alvin Mack in the program. Oh, he, no he big played, deal. Just my hero growing up. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Kill dude, everybody. <laughs> uh, dude, I'm telling you, I was telling Gabe in our last episode, I – copied everything that he did the way he talked <laughs> the way he played the way he moved around before the snap i mean my whole goal in life was to become alvin razor Mack. bear claw stinger loved it man that that was <laughs> that was everything to me that's awesome to hear yeah he and, and Dwayne i had no idea guy. his son played at ohio state I had no clue yeah he's really good and and so here's how Dwayne. here's Dwayne's range by the way Dwayne was a, a very average tight end at iowa and uh, so his range is he was Featherstone in Necessary Roughness. He was a wide receiver. Yep. But, but so he actually did not get the Alvin Mack role initially. And so he had a buddy. So the guy who played Latimer in the program was also in Necessary Roughness. So they'd been they'd worked the together. The, he, was the, right. he was the cowboy, right? In he necessary was the cowboy roughness. in Necessary Roughness. That's right. But he's, so he's a bodybuilder. His name's Andy Bynarski. And – so Andy Barnarski gets cast in the program and he calls Dwayne Davis and he's like, so when you, you come in, they, they were filming in Columbia, South Carolina at the at University of South Carolina. And they had like a two week training camp before they started filming where they basically put these dudes through the paces. Uh, a lot of the extras were, were ex college, ex South Carolina players, ex South Carolina state players, ex Clemson players. And, uh, and so they were putting them through a football camp just to kind of get everything down. Cause when they were filming, they needed them to be, pretty crisp like they had a halftime of the tennessee south carolina game to film a lot of the game scenes so they needed them to, to have it down and so by calls Dwayne davis and is like so when are you going you, you you're in this movie right because he'd, he'd auditioned for dallin mackerel and he's like i didn't get cast <laughs> so he gets a call like a week later and they said the guy we hired for alvin i'd I love to know who it was who got hired for alvin mack like, because they must have hired, like, a classically trained actor. And, like, Dwayne had been in a bunch of stuff by this point. He'd been on Head of the Class. and 20, Like, he roughed up Johnny Depp in 21 Jump Street. and um, But so, yeah, he, he gets a call. He's like, and they're like, uh, we, uh, yeah, the, the album Mac's not working out. Can you can you get over here? So he missed all the, the running around and sweating in, in nice. South Carolina heat and just dove into Alvin Mac. But so he played – he tried to play like Derek Brooks. That's kind of the look he was going for uh, in terms of playing style. So I also talked to, uh, to Mark Ellis, who is a former Appalachian State quarterback. His brother was Todd Ellis, who played QB at South Carolina. But Mark is one of the people who designs the football scenes in football movies. Like, so he worked on – What an program. awesome job. No oh, doubt. yeah, it's unbelievable. So he, but he does – and he does all sports movies now. He do, he'll do basketball scenes and all that. But so – he did the program. He did Friday Night Lights. He did some unnecessary roughness. He did the Water Boy, and so they had a scene. You know the scene where Alvin Mack breaks his leg. They're supposed to be at Iowa, and so they filmed that in an empty Williams Bryce Stadium because they didn't need the crowd for that. If you remember, the, it's it's they made it intentionally real dark because it's supposed to look like they're they're on the road, and so. Dwayne Davis had actually torn his ACL twice playing at Iowa. And the way the scene was written, he's like, dude, I'm going to tear my ACL if I do it the way you wrote it. And so he's arguing with the director that that's, this won't work. So they had to come up with another plan. So what they did is they dug like a three foot hole in the turf at Williams Bryce stadium. And I think that South Carolina season is over at this point. So I think they're, <laughs> I would they're, hope so. Hope so. <laughs> they're, they're okay to do this. Um, but they dig a hole and they put a prosthetic leg in the hole. And so he, cause he doesn't have a stunt double. He is the stunt double. And so he slides in and then has to grab this prosthetic leg and pick it up 
and it, it's it, it's a leg basically Foot's broken in, in eight different directions. Yeah, and he's got to get it set up for the camera as they're filming it. So that was uh, apparently they were digging a hole in the turf at Williams Rice Stadium at like three in the morning one morning, and that's what it was for for Such Alvin Mack cool to break movie. his leg. Such a cool movie. Such a cool role, man. He was awesome in that. I loved him in Digstown. I thought he was. I, was, I did too. I, was, I love I Digstown. That's a great, that's a great movie. movie. Yeah. And that's what I didn't, when I called him, I hadn't, I hadn't looked at that part of his IMDb page. And I'm like, oh my God, you were in Digstown too. You were the brother. And uh, it, it was, it was unbelievable. So yeah, he's a, uh, he's a pretty cool cat, but he, uh, he actually stopped acting because, so he, he got a lot of like tough guy soldier roles. He was in Under Siege. He was supposed to help save the world in Under Siege and then ended up changing his character around and he gets shot like within three seconds. Of, uh, of trying to help Steven Seagal and Eric Aleniak. <laughs> that but, was probably an interesting script change. He was like, oh, okay, sure. I'm yeah, trying to think, so, was, he, was he like a, a chef or a cook in that? In so he was one of the soldiers who got, uh, who got, tra who got trapped and who, who they were holding. And so they freed him and he and the, you know, Ryback, the Steven Seagal character, and Eric Aleniak and, and like two other guys form the plan and they go and he gets shot within 30 seconds yeah good death scene though <laughs> got, a play, got a playboy bunny hanging out a playboy playmate hanging all over him during his death Hon scene. honorable death honorable death yes. now a andy before we let you go man the players uh, they they were made aware of how much they mean to the universities i mean we started seeing all these numbers come out big time numbers what would happen if college football wasn't played you know how important they are for athletic departments and universities as a whole. And then you have the George Floyd thing, which kicks off the protests. And you've got all kinds of things happening in the college football world now. You got Chuba Hubbard uh, calling out Mike yeah. Gundy. Just this week, you've got Kylan Hill, who may be the best running back in the SEC, saying that he's not playing for Mississippi State unless they change the state flag. You've got Kerry Martin Jr. there at West Virginia calling out Vic Coning just here in the last couple of days. Man, it, is this what you expected? Because I think a lot of people think that they ju this just may be a phase, but I kind of think this is here to stay. These guys know their platform now. They know their worth, and they're more comfortable speaking out. Yeah, and, and I think – it's it's not a phase it's a shift and you it, you notice the places it's not happening like clemson had an incident you know they they had the the danny pierman thing from 2017 come back up but the players were very supportive of dabo sweeney so i i think you need to look at it. look at oklahoma what has anything has anybody had anything and and i think a lot of that has to do with oklahoma's already dealt with this when eric striker was on the team and was was dealing with a lot of stuff and leading a lot of stuff and, and talking it out with the coaching staff and that sort of thing. You know, I think Oklahoma figured out how to deal with it. I think, you know, different staffs deal with this stuff differently. And the ones that show the players they care, that make the players feel like they are a welcome part of the program, they're not dealing with any of this stuff. Now, the Mississippi State thing is, is completely different. That's a state right. flag thing. Like, the – Ole Miss and Mississippi State don't even fly the state flag on their campuses because they're they know it's a problem. So you know it, that one's a little bit different animal than some of these other ones. Like the Iowa one was not different at all. The Iowa one was a case of this was the culture in the program. It did not mesh well with with certain guys, and and I wonder with the Iowa thing because Chris Doyle was obviously you know the cornerstone of of the program. That they, they always talk about how great their strength program was and how much it meant to them. He lasted a day once all that stuff came out. And the more and more I think about it, the more I read what the, what the former Iowa players were saying, I do wonder, did they lose out on some recruits? Did they hmm. lose out on some good players? Because it seemed like that was a pretty well-known thing among players within the program. And that's one of those sort of things that you come on your official visit and, you know, maybe, maybe they, they, hip you to that and you're like yeah i don't think i could i don't think i'd like it here but i think if you look at the programs that have handled things a certain way through the years 
you're not seeing issues with them. Like you're not seeing issues with Oklahoma because the culture of that program is different. And I don't know. I, I know a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, this, you know, this generation soft, blah, blah. It sure looks like Oklahoma's kicking ass in the Big 12, and they don't seem to have any issues like this. It sure looks like, you know, Clemson had an incident, but the players seem very much behind Dabo Sweeney. Maybe it has something to do with the way the program is run. Yeah. I, 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 just while you're saying that, I'm, I'm wondering in my head, and this is just like maybe a reason, but, you know, is there any thought that maybe guys at teams that are really good that mm-hmm. have, a, have a chance to win a championship – or maybe they've got a, a five-star recruit behind them that it's like, you know, I would love to come out, but I don't feel like, you know, I, I don't know. I, like, I, I wonder if it's if there's any of that I built there, in. Like, there's a there, lot there's on probably the line. Some of that. There's more on heard, the line yeah. for those guys. Yeah, you haven't heard anything from guys at Alabama or Georgia or places where there, there is a five-star waiting behind you, no matter who you are. You could be Ohio really State, good. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. But – also, you look at Ohio State, you look at Clemson, they've been very open about letting their players have a platform. Mm-hmm. I mean, Trevor Lawrence was, was talking almost immediately. The whole team at Ohio State was talking almost immediately. So, like Iowa, they were trying to muzzle them. And I don't think that worked out very well for them. Remember, Iowa had that deal where they, they initially agreed to the guys were banned from Twitter, and then it was, you can tweet once a month, but we have to approve it. <laughs> Like, totally. the year of our Lord 2020. You're not going to make it doing that. Hey, Come Coach, on, listen. I met this hot girl out at the bar. I was yeah. thinking about – Can I slide in our DMs, okay. please? <laughs> Is that uh, cool? I, it's just – I mean, college football is changing. It, it yeah. is. I, I think when you when you look at the players, they, they understand it's only going to change more, Andy, when the name, image, and likeness stuff goes through, right? I mean, you think about that. Ooh. Yeah, it's I don't know. You know, everybody's worried that. Oh, I'm not worried. Making, I'm making excited more money for it. Than another. I know, but I just think it's funny because you're like, what happens when uh, when a second string player is making more than a starter? I'm like, welcome to the real world. Starters <laughs> should play better. Yeah, yeah, you're you're gonna have a job at some point where you think somebody's not as good at you as you at the job, and and they're making more money. That's how it works. I I but I, I wanted to ask you guys this because because you guys have been through this at multiple levels i feel like athletes are better prepared to deal with stuff like this because every day the first team goes out and the second team guys know they're not on it like you learn to deal with hierarchies and somebody being favored over another person and you either don't like it and you have to change it or you just accept it i mean i I, here's the thing is in the nfl locker room you've got a massive discrepancy in pay. Oh yeah. You, you may have a, a free agent, uh, you know, whatever position corner that comes in and signs for, you know, 15, $18 million a year. And the other guy started three years. And it's like, hang on a second, man. I've got more interceptions. No one throws my web, got more tackles, more pass breakups. I'm more productive from him. They're like, well, I'm sorry about your luck. You've got a contract that's coming up. Right. I mean, there, there is a massive discrepancy even within position groups as to who's getting paid what. So um, I think it's something that is – it's you fix it on the field. I mean, yeah. just yeah. like Gates. People aren't punching better. each other over it. It's not – yeah, it's not and – it, and it's the same way in every office in America. They're, they're different pay you – know, everybody makes different money, and people aren't walking around screaming at each other about it. They just learn to deal with it. I think the social media – aspect um you know there is a tiny tiny bit of good buried in all the horrible (laughs) god-awful crap out there in social media and i think part of it is players are showing up to college way more prepared under understanding the scrutiny that they're going to be under understanding the spotlight that they're going to have uh understanding um the crazy fans the good fans uh, you know, there's just a whole lot more. Like, I walked up to University of Oklahoma, had no clue what I was getting into at all on, on yeah. any level. These guys know it. And 
you know, you've even started to see a lot of the specialized training. You go train with the quarterback coach and it's, you know, he's, he's training you on the field, obviously, but he's also saying, Hey, I trained so-and-so quarterback two years ago who didn't take care of his grades or Mm -hmm. made a dumb post on social media. So you're getting that type of training from those situations as well. And I think, I mean, these guys are going into college way more prepared for both on the field and off the field than ever before. Well, and, and so my Friday podcast that that'll, come out on Friday morning, I talked to the AD at Tulane and one of the law professors there because they're they're doing their NIL program, their education program in-house. Some people are hiring a consultant, some people are hiring a company, but they're they're doing it with their in partnership with their law school and their med school and business school. And it's really interesting because a lot of the a lot of what they're going to be teaching them is like basic contract law, things that they're going to use in their lives. Like even if you're a Tulane player who never gets a, an endorsement deal or anything like that, you're going to get some useful education out of this and, and maybe something more useful than you got in any of your classes. So I actually think there's, there's some good real world applications to this. Even if it's just what you, what you mentioned, Teddy, like the social media posts, even if it's just cleaning up your social media so that when you do apply for a job after college, they don't find something that they flag and, and not hire you. Like yeah. if that's the best, the, the only thing that comes out of it for you, you won. Guys, I, it's, it's not important for them to know how to do taxes or <laughs> how to send business emails. They need to know that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Okay. It All is. Right? It is. Here, here's a conversation that I never thought I would hear in college, but is probably right around the corner. Hey man, why don't you come out with us tonight? We're all, you know, we're all going out to the bar. Nah, hey, I'd love to go, but I got this, this, uh, this contract with uh, Joe Blow GMC down the street, yeah. and I gotta lay low, man. I don't want to get in trouble and mess up that contract. It's like, yeah, that's it. Huh? That's what, what I'm okay. waiting for. How many? Because because you guys have worked in radio. How many swap deals are gonna be with? Are there gonna be with car dealerships? You drive this car while you while you chill for us, like that. I mean, that's going to be a good one to to see how how often that works out. Because I mean that's that's the thing. If you're a radio a sports talk host in a medium sized city, the best thing about it is you're getting a free truck to drive. <laughs> you're, you're doing a swap with the local dealership, an ad swap. So, I mean that that's. Gabe and I, I had curious. this conversation before. Is you know under the current rules, if if a group of offensive linemen go hang out at a, a local nice bar and restaurant mm-hmm. and you know, the owner or manager comes up and says, Hey guys, it's on us tonight. That's a violation. Right. You know, but under these, these, these new rules, just sign them to a deal. You get, you get, you I, I get six meals you, a month. Yeah. I don't even think you have to sign them to a deal. I mean, the, for court to hold up the, the negotiation between services you know, mm-hmm. rendered and paid is very loose. Right. So, I mean, I just wonder, like, how how do you regulate all of that? A lot stuff? of free is, meals for linemen, baby. Is Let's that now go. A, huh. Here, a my, my thing is, don't still? regulate it at all. I say, yeah. don't regulate it at all. They're gonna try because they don't they don't want it to be a recruiting inducement. Now, I think there are gonna be people who use it as a recruiting inducement. But there's no way they don't. There's yeah, already there already are. I mean. There's already people who drop bags for recruits. It's fine. I mean, the, the world has been going on for a hundred years. So, I mean, I would say the the simplest thing is just stop worrying about it, and it'll it'll all work itself out. Because I don't think investing that kind of money in a 17 year old is a very wise investment. And I think you probably lose your money pretty quickly and realize, you know, I think I might wait until that guy's until somebody's established themselves. And see if they're any good. Well, the thing is, is, I mean, say if Oklahoma, for example, Adrian Peterson comes in as a freshman. And hey, the like, man. You know, <laughs> well, right away, <laughs> uh, after you saw that first carry in his first game, it's like, uh, that guy's going to be an NFL Hall of Famer. We need to hitch ourselves to this wagon, whatever we need to do to do it. So, but, and, uh, and, that's, and that's fine. And yeah. that, that will be fine under the, under the rules they're making. You know, once once that person's on campus, go to town. But 
it's going to be interesting because there are going to be schools that figure out how to use it well, and there are going to be schools that fight. Like, I keep laughing at, like, the North Carolina and Duke ADs that are like, well, I'm not sure we want to do it this way. Too late, guys. You had a chance to talk about that five years ago. Mm -hmm. But the state of California and the state of Florida and the state of Colorado decided we're going to do it this way, and so you're going to do it that way. So now figure out how to best use it. And, I, I, and I've talked to people at schools, and trust me, the wheels are in motion with these coaches and these ADs to try to figure out how to turn it to their advantage. Because that's, well, that's what college football is all about. How do you turn the rules to your advantage? He is Andy Staples. You can read his work on The Athletic. Go download The Andy Staples Show. Is that That's available all major podcast Every, anywhere platforms. Anywhere podcasts are available, yeah. I am I'm a uh, regular listener. I will always send you a text about something you said, like, my, like our mutual hate for mayonnaise. Exactly. I, we, for those who don't know, if you want a back episode that you really want, really want to sink your teeth into, when Dukes announced that they were going to sponsor – the old Belk Bowl, Duke's Mayonnaise. I brought in Ryan McGee from ESPN, who is a lover of Duke's Mayonnaise, and we spent 23 minutes arguing about mayonnaise. <laughs> it was great. It really was. I was right. <laughs> Yo, uh, you 100%. I was Team Andy in that argument. So go subscribe, download Andy's podcast, read his stuff at The Athletic, and go follow him on Twitter at Andy underscore Staples. Appreciate the time, big guy. Thanks, guys. Thanks to Andy Staples for joining us, Ted. That guy can – he can talk it all, man. I love it. That's – I think that's the first time I've, I've done an interview or had a conver uh, conversation with Andy. That was fantastic. Yeah. So, go check his stuff out at The Athletic. He is still crushing it over there. Crushed it while he was at Sports Illustrated and is still doing his thing. All right, Ted, let's get to some segments. And since it is Thursday – you know we got to wet the beak just a little bit, just a little bit, and it's official. My boycott of baseball has been lifted because they're coming back. It's happening. Now, there's not going to be any spitting or sunflower seeds or <laughs> chewing tobacco, which it, is it even baseball if those things aren't involved, but there also will be no DH in NL games, which I love. There will be a 60-game season starting around July 24th, 40 games versus teams in the division, 20 games versus interleague opponents in the same division, and there's some win totals that are out for all teams. But, Teddy, I really just want to look at one to wet the beak, and that is the Houston Astros. Because now that baseball is coming back, we all remembered that we were supposed to hate these dudes, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Now, the Houston Astros' win total is set at 35-and-a-half by betonline.ag. That is the third highest win total only behind the Dodgers and Yankees. What do you think about that number for the Houston Astros? 35-and-a-half. Um... I would probably take the over. Now, it's interesting to, to look at this. Like, I'm not a baseball guy, so I don't know if a 60-game schedule favors the better teams or if it favors the teams that there's some separation there and, and it helps them keep it closer. You know, Houston last year won, you know, right at two-thirds of their games which would put them at 40 wins if you match that up with this year. Um, so that's a decent little cushion there. You know, who knows if they, they can live up to that. That's probably where I would go. And as long as um, their players continue to get beamed at a very high <laughs> level like they did in that's spring my... training, then I think that's going to be good for them to continue to get guys on, on base and scoring position. Yeah, I, I, I like them to hit the over here. No doubt. I still think despite them being cheaters, they still have a lot of good baseball players. They still have got Altuve, Bregman. They still got Verlander, Grinky. So they've got players. It's, and for, for Houston, it's been like, uh, oh my God, this coronavirus is great. This is the ever. best thing ever. As soon as we get to back to baseball, it's like, oh, what? 
Yeah, we're supposed to hate you guys. I hate you guys. I hate you. Altuve was wearing a buzzer. He was wearing a wire. Hit him in the face. No, it's, <laughs> it, it's going to be fun. I, I think everyone that's not a Houston Astros fan is going to really enjoy hating the Houston Astros together this year. That's uh, what I'm, this I'm very excited needs. about it. We can all unite b- behind well, hating the Houston Astros. I, I will say this. One of the things that brings people so close together when it comes to sports is being able to bitch about the same things. Like, literally, we can complain to each other that common human experience where you just get to let it all out about something. And we're going to all get to do that with the Astros during this 60 game season. And I can't wait. Now, Ted, 35 and a half, you're taking the over for wins. What would be a reasonable line for hit by pitch for the hit Houston batsman. Astros? Hit uh, batsman. Um, I would say more. Will they have more wins or more batters hit in the season? More, more batters hit. Here's the thing. Um, you, it's it, there needs to be an over under every day because it's going to be different in some games in a tight baseball game they're not going to be hitting guys but if you're getting blown out by Houston and the eighth inning rolls around someone's getting stroked with the I, baseball I think Clayton <laughs> Kershaw may just hit all of them right gosh it, poor it, Kershaw. Dude, if, if I gave up a bomb over the last couple of years to Houston you better believe you're is you Darvish still in the league? Is he still in the league? Didn't they kind of ruin you, you Darvish's career? Yeah, he's throwing right at their spines. You Darvish is has turned into the Ray Finkel of Major <laughs> League Baseball after what the Houston Astros have done to him. Yeah, but I, I can't some, wait. He's in a basement somewhere. I, and I'm also – I'm legitimately excited for the 60 games. I, I will fully admit, I only watch playoff baseball. That's how – that's the kind of – baseball fan I've been for many years now that the games mean a little more I may tune in to a little more baseball I know that this whole back and forth between the players association and the league has really turned some true baseball fans off from the game like they're all mad about it but now that there's not 160 plus games and there's only 60 I'm probably going to tune in a little more to be honest does that make me a bad person maybe no I I mean at first, whenever they agreed to this deal, I was like, who cares? Don't watch baseball. Don't care about baseball. The way this whole thing has gone down has actually made me like baseball even less. Uh, but now I've had, I've had some time to sleep on it. And 60 games, I'm kind of like, you know, Maybe. 100, 162 is a lot to commit to. To follow so before we even get to, to the playoffs. It's so much baseball. And I don't have the time or the energy to commit to something that takes that long. 60 games, though. Especially like, okay. you throw the runner on second base in all the extra inning games. Adds a little excitement for me. I kind of I, I kind of enjoy like, watching that. Is there going to put a live body on second base or is it going to be like a ghost runner in wiffle ball? I think like, it's a live okay, yeah. body. We all just agree that I there's think, a runner on second, right? I, okay. And I, I didn't read the rules thoroughly, but I, I'm pretty sure the guy that is running from second is the guy that made the last out for them. I think that's right. I, I, I was about could, to say. I could mean, be wrong. Um, that will suck if it's a really fat guy that can't run. I was going to say, like, if, if you can put anyone you want out there, that's a roster spot for some Olympic sprinters, right? Oh, for sure. All right, Ted, let's move on to our winners and losers of the week. Like our man Toby Key says, we got winners, we got losers. Ted, who do you have as your winner of the week? I think the winner of the week is definitely a uh, cryptozoologist everywhere. Loch Ness monster uh, okay. photo. Did you say well, – okay, what are – what are your thoughts on the photo? Because I saw it and I looked at it and I was like, okay, the guy had time to take a photo, but there's no video. I mean, if you see the Loch Ness monster, if you're staring right at Nessie, how do you not video it? What are we doing? I, I would say the chances that whatever he took a picture of, uh, the chances of it being uh, the Loch Ness monster are somewhere between zero and zero. 
I don't know what it is, probably a gigantic fish, but I don't care right now. I need something else. Let's talk about uh, Bigfoot. Let's talk about Nelly or Nessie. Let's talk about all of it. I, I don't know. Let's talk I'm about Bigfoot. Nelly and how yeah. country grammar was an absolute banger <laughs> of an baby. album. Love but it. I saw the picture and you're right. Let's talk about it. Cause I stared at it for like 20 minutes. I was like, well, I was trying to see like if it was Photoshopped. I was like checking the edges and everything. I like, I, I pulled it up on my computer. I saw it, someone sent it to me on my phone. I pulled it up on my phone and looked at it and I was like, I got to take a better look at this. So I pulled it up on my computer and I was, you know, zooming in. I was like, ah, maybe someone what giant said fish, that giant there's fish. some type of giant catfish over there in that part of the, of the world that gets huge and there's some similarities whenever you look at it and, and the picture but the guy said that what he took a picture of was about eight feet and that's just the part that's exposed you don't see a head you don't see a tail if that's eight feet of a fish then the fish is like 30 feet long do we have to establish a, an official stance on this as a podcast i i i think we we're Nessie believers, right? Why not? I, Why not? Who cares? I'll get behind yeah, I'll, it. I'll get behind it. I've seen enough uh, Discovery Channel back in the day to have a decent enough understanding as to what's going on over there. The lake is like a thousand feet deep. Uh, there, there's something in there. I'll just right? I'll roll with you, Gabe. There's something in. I there. don't know what it is. I don't want to mess with it, but I would love to see all of it. That's all. I I'm can't saying. prove to you. Well, that there is, but you can't prove to me that there's not. So boom. we're at a stalemate, folks. Boom. Lawyered. Boom. All right, Ted, who do you have as your loser of the week? Well, loser of the week is uh, Big Tobacco, Big Sunflower Seed, and <laughs> Big Bubble Gum. No spitting in baseball, no sunflower seeds in baseball, no tobacco, uh, bubble. I mean, what All are, of the <laughs> serious question, what are some of these guys that have been dipping for a decade playing baseball? Like, what are they going to do? I, I mean, it affects you chemically, and some guys do it, you know, that whether it's nicotine gum or dip to, you know, to lock in, to focus. Are, are we going to see some of these longtime dippers really struggle at the plate? I don't know. Um, I guess you could always just not spit. I mean, I, oh, <laughs> I mean, I don't There's know. There's some high school football coach in like Sepulpa that just heard that and was like, "Hell yeah, brother!" <laughs> Only real just swallow man. it. Um, I, you know, I don't know why I picked Sepulpa. <laughs> that was so random. Hardcore dippers and and chewing tobacco up in Sepulpa. My, the interesting thing about it to me is I, are we going to like slow-mo replay at the plate to see if someone spit uh, while they're in the batter's box or zoom in on the, the second we baseman? We now pause the action for an official review on spitting. What? Was, that a, was that a spit or was that just, uh, you know, was he talking? and Just and, Joe I, Buck breaking it down in slow motion. Well, uh, see, that's not spit. That's phlegm. He was coughing. That's not, that is not count as a spit. I, I don't know how they're like, is it just they're, they're all agreeing on that? Or is it something that they're going to actually it like seems, hardcore enforce? It, it seems like a, hey, try your best type rule. Like right. we know that spitting and chewing is a huge part of baseball culture, but uh, try your best. Yeah. I mean, they can't punish guys for spitting. Really? I mean, they can't do that, right? Poor sunflower seeds. I mean, big tobacco has been through the ringer over the years, and this is like their last stand, and coronavirus has, has hammered them. That's They thought, well, everyone else is getting hammered by coronavirus. We're going to be just fine. Well, Big, no. big tobacco and big sunflower seed are going to be – they're going to be in Washington, D.C. lobbying <laughs> real quick. They're, they want a vaccine quicker than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> we're overflowing with sunflower seeds you're going to be able to get cheap sunflower seeds big league teams go through uh those five gallon buckets of sunflower seeds like it's nothing yeah they'll have to get rid of them 
before they go bad. Just saying, maybe maybe we can uh, we can get a lot of packs. For, Here's the other thing for, for a good price. They also said they're discouraging showering after the game, which mm. I don't understand. I've been told since the beginning of March that the best thing you can do is wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. That's going to completely get the virus off of you. How is that not the same thing with it, the rest of your body? Is it just that they don't want the guys to be in close proximity, you know, no well, sword fighting and such, <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't know. It seems like you could have a one in one out mentality or have kind of like single showers for the guys. And yeah. <laughs> only hey, Listen, a strict rules this year, only five guys to one shower head. Okay. We're, we're social distancing. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Baseball. A lot of baseball talk. I did not see that coming. All right, Ted, my winner of the week. Good dads. Good dads. Yes. Trevor Ariza skipping the NBA restart in Orlando to spend a month with his 12 year old son who he is in a custody battle over. And this is the month of a visitation available to him. I think. That is extremely admirable. Uh, I do not think that it helps the Portland Trailblazers' chances of making the playoffs because Ariza is still a solid player. But I saw that and I go, you know what? You choose family over everything. And then you see what Avery Bradley did, skipping Orlando. When he is on the favorite to win the NBA championship, He's skipping it because his six-year-old son has a history with respiratory illness, and he just can't run that risk. So that couldn't have been an easy decision. I I mean, can you imagine you think you're going to win a title and you have to walk away and not play, especially when you're a big-time contributor to the team? That had to be really tough. But I was really impressed by those two guys. And then another good dad moment this week. I got this picture from my dad saying that he bought some Will and Wiley because they were sponsoring this podcast and he tried it and he thinks it's delicious, Teddy. So look at my dad supporting us. How about that? Brings a tear to your eye, Gabe. One person at a time. I mean, converted your dad. Will and Wiley, you got to love it, man. It's special. He went with the mango guava, too. What oh, a good choice. Gosh. What good a wise choice. choice. Yeah, Look. here's the thing. If you go with the wrong wrong flavor sometimes, because the flavors hit you differently, and if you don't choose wisely right out of the gate, you want to have a good first experience. So he made a good good decision. As for the, you know, Avery Bradley and Trevor Ariza, those are incredibly easy decisions but you make them knowing that there's hard consequences right um if i'm in a room with my son someone tosses a grenade through the window it's an easy decision i dive on the grenade but there's hard consequences right and whenever you're a father and you've got to make these decisions for your son they come incredibly easy but you do have to swallow the the tough consequences, and th- that's that's the hard part for these guys. I mean, you know what you're going to do right away when presented with the the decision. You know exactly what's going to happen, um, but that doesn't mean that there's not parts of you that are. Um, you're usually more upset at the circumstances, the whatever has has gone on that's that's put you in that position, but the decision on something like that is always really easy. You always take your son. Yeah. Uh, I assume it's like when I'm walking the dogs and another dog kind of barks at him and gets aggressive and I get in between him, I look at him with the craziest look in my eyes. It's something like that, Ted. Am I on the right track here? Yeah. Well, I'm not a dad, so I I don't know. But I I thought it was really admirable. Without hesitation, throw yourself between your dog and a F-150, Gabe. Oh, there's no doubt. No doubt. I'm I'm, I'm taking that F-150 straight to the chest. (laughs) Let's roll, boys. But I I just thought it was really cool. I thought it was really cool. It was a great reminder, even though, you know, we've been starving 
for live sports, right? We've been starving for the NBA to come back that you see these guys put family over everything. It's a good reminder of what really, really, really matters in life. The tough decision is whenever – When LeBron calls. (laughs) When LeBron (laughs) calls or your agent calls. No, it's like these guys have the ability to say, I want to be there. Um, I want to win a championship. I, I want the money that comes with it. But they have the ability to say, I, we're fine. We're going to survive uh, just fine. The, the tough decision is whenever you've got to make a decision between uh, providing or being there. And there's, there's, there's guys that have to make that decision all the time. And that's, right. that's the difficult one because you're not sure which way is right. Right. All right, my loser of the week, Universal Pictures. Let me explain. Uh, According to Variety, Universal is having talks about a Twister reboot. Yes, that Twister. Why would they do this to us? You can't remake something that's perfect. Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt were amazing. They, They can't recreate that type of dysfunctional love. Teddy, no. they can't recreate Philip Seymour Hoffman rocking the shit out of that OU hat. How are they going to outdo the original? Why would they do this? I, I don't understand. They, I, I know. Gary England's retired. Do they not know these things? I'll answer the question as to why they're doing it. They're out of ideas. <laughs> they, they have no more ideas. They're essentially remaking every movie that's ever done well uh, at the box office or even afterwards, uh, cult classics, they're out of ideas. They've got nothing else to go for. They're trying to go with the easy. This, they say, well, the story's not that all, all that difficult to recreate, but the, uh, the computer-generated uh, graphics are going to be so much better. We can make it so much more realistic. That's probably what they're banking on. The whole thing, instead of being shot around Oklahoma and in different places. Oh, it better be in Oklahoma. It's going to be shot in a studio in front of a green screen. Oh, it's going to be terrible. Depressing. I'm I'm with you. It's total crap. Uh, I just pretty much every remake that I've seen has been awful. Yeah, I I guess they even made what do they call it? Like a live action. I I refuse to see the live action version of Lion King. I just refuse. Haven't seen it. Won't see it. Don't need it in my life. But. One funny thing about the original Twister, uh, I once heard a rumor that Philip Seymour Hoffman was wearing the OU hat because I don't think OU would let them put the OU sticker on Dorothy, the, you know, the machines that they set out in front with all the things to go up and get the readings. I wonder if that's true. There's got to be someone at OU we can talk to that knows if that's true or not, right? I mean, it seems like you would just slap the OU on there. It, in hindsight, It would be um, like if they did make that decision, they'd probably say it's a mistake because, I mean, I know a lot of people come here to this university already for the weather program that is just fantastic. And that's just free advertising, right? I mean, that's free advertising. If if you want to go to Twisters, you go to Oklahoma, baby. Everyone knows that. But come on, Universal. You don't need to reboot Twister. You don't need to do that. Don't do that to us. We, no. that, that movie is sacred. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. I would say if you can bring back the, the full original cast, I will, uh, I will bring back Jamie Gertz. I will reluctantly agree to it, but Philip Seymour Hoffman says, RIP. since he's not around, then scrap the whole idea. But he was great. He was that van. He, he was one of my favorite actors, dude. He's what, awesome. What a performance. All right, Ted, let's finish up like we always do. That's with everyone's favorite segment, Keeping It Local, where we highlight what's going on in the great state of Oklahoma. And tonight's kind of has a more serious tone, but I think it's important to talk about. And that is the fact that Athlete A is out on Netflix. And the documentary focuses on gymnasts who survived Larry Nassar's sexual abuse 
and the reporters from the Indiana Star that exposed Nasser and the toxic culture within USA Gymnastics. Now it's local because as many people know, the title comes from OU gymnast Maggie Nichols. Now I want to make it very clear that Maggie Nichols is quite possibly the best college gymnast ever. She's got so many national championships that it's kind of hard to keep track of. She has a very real argument for being on the Mount Rushmore of OU athletes of all time, any sport. I mean, that, that's the impact she's had. But her impact away from gymnastics is what really makes her special in my mind. And I watched this documentary today, and it is really – difficult to watch it, it really is but she was the first gymnast to file a complaint against Nasser, and that eventually led to Nasser being exposed for the monster that he is and it led to a lot of women being able to speak out about their experiences and get some closure and i think it had a big impact on society where women that had experienced sexual abuse felt more comfortable speaking out about it because Maggie Nichols did what she did. And I highly recommend watching it. Uh, probably don't watch it with your kids. Um, it is infuriating. There are some really moving interviews from the victims, from parents. And at the end, you're, you're just so mad at USA Gymnastics. But I think it's important for people to watch. And I think that Maggie Nichols is way more than all the championships she won. In my mind, she is someone that has changed the course of history in this country. And it is an absolute honor that she went to Oklahoma. I think you couldn't find a better representative of that university than Maggie Nichols. And this couldn't have been easy for her. And she, she really shines in this documentary. Uh, she is just, she's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I have not seen it yet, but I'm going to watch it. It's going to really make You are mad. going to be very, very upset. When I watch stuff like this, like I get, I get mad. I, you know, I get mad. That's my reaction. Um, but I'm going to watch it. I, I, I'm totally with you on everything that she's done. I didn't know a lot about this until Jason Kersey wrote an article about it. Oh, yeah, I, and I Kersey's mean, article is great. Go check had, that out in The Athletic. I had, Are we sponsored by The Athletic? <laughs> <laughs> we got Staples, I, we got Kersey. I knew she was involved in some form or fashion, but I really didn't know a whole lot about it. Um, you know, as what she did when she did it kept her was, off the Olympic team. It, it's it, it's essentially kind of signing like your death notice in gymnastics. Like you're done. You are you are um, you know no one's going to come around you. You're not going to be brought around. It's like it's basically saying my career is over. And she took it in stride, stepped up, did the right thing, and. Um, everyone right now is way better off because of that. Um, I know that, that these girls have gone through just unspeakable things and how, how horrible that's been that so many had to internalize all of these things and fear of telling parents, fear of telling teammates, fear of telling coaches. Um, that is a horrible way to go through something like this. And uh, I, I'm going to watch it. It's going to make me mad. I'm a huge women's gymnastics fan whenever it comes to the – like, it's my favorite part of the Olympics. Every time it comes around, I'm dialed in. I love it. And it's going to make me mad because I just know, and there's going to be a lot of names in there that I've always uh, followed, liked, um, whatever, that turned a turned – a, not necessarily a blind eye knew and did nothing 
And there, in my opinion, there's nothing worse than that. So it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be frustrating and difficult, but I'll probably watch it as soon as we sign off here. Yeah. Just, you're going to be mad and, and we all should be mad, but the courage and bravery of Maggie Nichols and the rest of those victims, uh, I think, uh, I really do. I, I think it changed the world. I, I think it changed this country. And on that note, what episode 19, we're, we're getting up there now. Whoa. Is it 19 Whoa. or is it 18? I don't even know now. We're getting up there, but let's go 19, 18. I don't know. I like it. In the I'm, books. In the books, man. But Fantastic. we'll have a new podcast that'll drop Monday morning. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on Sports Talk 1400. And you can hear me on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great weekend. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. And do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other. We're looking away for another night. And tell me that you love me. Ever's true. I don't want no one, girl, if I can't have you. This Oklahoma breakdown, I know it's got you crying. Let me tell you that I love you one more time. And tell me that you love me. Ever's true. I don't want no one, girl, if I can't have you. This Oklahoma breakdown, I know it's got you crying. Let me tell you that I love you one more time. Just one more time. Let me tell you one time, you know. Just one more time. Just one more